good. That's good. I like a guy who can sing like that and also a bus captain. And uh, he and his crew were out in Quail Valley this morning and picking up people on the bus. And, and uh, you know, Quail Valley is a lot like Cana. Can any good, or Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Quail Valley? But, uh, hey, you were there. Amen. But um, thank you, Ray, and his family. Such a blessing. I didn't mention earlier, I don't want to forget about this. Brother Beal, am I right? This Friday is our first football game. Uh, we are we are in serious my note says 7 p.m. at FBA Bowl right down here uh, first tackle football game there's not many uh, because of a lot of logistics and and legalities you can't play as many football games you can basketball games so you don't want to miss those and there's an admission because we got to rent refs and we've got to rent lights and everything else uh, but anyway you uh, you can come out and pray our pray our young men wanting to preach don't don't end up in wheelchairs and all those things. So anyway, I mean, I don't want to jinx you guys, but anyway, uh, it's a good thing. I, if you'll be a part of that, it'd be great. And then also, um, uh, the Equipping the Saints, our Wednesday night program, if you're going to be involved in teaching any kind of a ministry or you just are interested in knowing more what the Bible says about Bible doctrine, we have during our Wednesday Bible study, every now and then, a 12-week period starts in two weeks. Brother Sandberg, am I right? Two, two Wednesdays away. On the second, I believe it is, uh, 12 weeks, 24 Bible doctrines. It's page by page, fill in the blank, exactly. You'll see exactly scripturally uh, what you believe. There's two sections, uh, 24 doctrines each. If you've done the first, you can take the second during the same time. Steve Sandberg over here oversees that. That's a part of our Wednesday night. And it's so important to, to us that you know what the Bible teaches. And um, every, and by the way, just because the Bible says something doesn't mean you need to build your life on it because every cult in America in particular is built on a Bible believing church somebody who left that church with a doctrine and then they went off crazy on some haywire thing and so you want to know what the Bible says you want to know what the you got the scriptures search the scriptures Jesus said and we ought to know the Word of God and that's my goal and that's why we do this and we want our teachers to have all gone through this so we all we all on the same page we all study and we all know what the bible says so important because uh, let god be true and every man a liar the bible says and pre preachers are going to let you down and I, I really try not to but i'm human and i'll disappoint you but i can tell you that book will never disappoint you uh, that's where you can put your faith and your rest so if you want to be in the, the equipping the saints uh, Wednesday night program, there's a sign-up sheet I, I, in one of the tables in the foyer. I think Brother Donnelly's table took over that table, but, uh, or talk to Steve. Raise your hand once more, would you, Steve? It is on the other table. It's on the other table. Okay, so you can see Steve Sandberg. He's the brains around here, and uh, he'll help you with any of that. Brother Donnelly's our friend, and uh, he'll be preaching, so you'll enjoy hearing it. Brother Donnelly, come on. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here this morning. This is a good crowd for the second hour, amen? amen. And um, thank you for coming. This is, of course, the most intelligent crowd. Is that correct? That's what I've heard. And um, brother, brother John, right? Your girlfriend's here. I know her. That's a Gwen, isn't it? Oh, my word. I need to talk to you about him before the service is over. But anyway... <laughs> And um, we can arrange a shotgun wedding. You come back to Texas. We do those things in Texas all the time. And um, she won't have a choice, and we can just get it all done with. Amen? But anyway, and, um, but no, I'm, I'm excited that your girlfriend's here. And I've, I've, we've known each other since she was a little bit smaller than this. Not that she's big. I just thought that was bad. <laughs> Woo, let's try that one all over again. But anyway, we've known each other for a while. Her dad and I are very good friends. And um, we go back to West Virginia days. And um, it's, um, it's good to see you again. I'll tell my wife I saw you and um, that she's still going to church. That's amazing. She's not dating the smartest guy or the most handsome guy, but she is at least dating somebody. Amen. And um, Dominic, I'm Dominic. Nick, what, which one is it? Dominic. Dominic. You need to get Dominique. But anyway. <laughs> You'll be my friend. You're big enough. I need you to be my friend. I know the preachers, you and, have, you and the preacher having problems. You're my friend, okay? And, um, but anyway, no. I enjoyed Last night, I got to preach to the teenage, to the high schoolers. And um, they had an activity, had a good time with them. And um, one, they went around and was taking some sort of, what was it, what was it called? Clue Chase. Huh? Clue Chase. Yeah, so, Clue Chase. And uh, which team won? Which team won? Are they even in here? Wow. 
the cheaters won. They ran the red light. Is that right? They ran the red light. So some of the some of the teenagers will be at the altar this morning and getting right about running a red light. And um, but anyway, uh, you come back tonight for the great evening service. Six fifteen is the singing time, and then at six thirty service starts. Don't want to miss it and be a part of it. And um, I I was picked up at preacher talking about the gas. I arrived yesterday. I'll tell you this. I arrived yesterday. I'm looking at the gas prices. It's like you guys are being killed with gas prices. Don't mean to rub this in at all, but I do. It's all, I only pay $2.14 a gallon. Anybody want to move to Texas? It's hotter down there. I can tell you that right now. And um, But anyway, no, you got a great thing going here. This is a great church. If you're a visitor, let me encourage you to come back next Sunday. Pastor Goddard will be preaching. He's the one who, who God's used to help pastor this church for many years. And um, I'm just a visiting preacher. I won't be here to visit you in the hospital. I won't be here to help you through your heartache. He is. I'd encourage you to come back, give him a chance. And um, if you don't like me, you'll like him. And um, if you like me, you won't like him. No, just kidding you. And, um, but truly, truly, what a great church. I hope that you would come back and then be back again tonight. Job chapter number 8. Job chapter number 8. Job chapter number 8. We're going to start reading in verse 1 this morning. Job chapter 8 and verse 1. Once you have found it, let's all stand as we read the word of God this morning. Job chapter 8 and verse 1. If you have it, give a good hearty amen. amen. All right, I think the ladies have it. Let's see if the men have it. If you have it, give a good hearty amen. amen. There we go. The Bible says in verse 1, Then answered Bildad, the Shuhite, and said, How long? Wilt thou speak these things? That's what you think of us preachers sometimes, isn't it? But anyway, <laughs> how long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Doth God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert justice? If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression, if thou wouldest seek unto God be times, and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou art pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon earth are shadow. Shall not they teach thee and tell thee and utter words out of their heart? Can the rush grow up without the mire? Can the flag grow without water? While it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. Oftentimes, as you read the scriptures, uh, when you go through the book of Job, there's three friends. These three friends, I'll be honest with you, speak a lot of foolishness. But every once in a while, I said this to the, to the, um, to the, um, to the people here in the earlier service, I said, every once in a while a fool can say something good. And that's the case here in verse 11, when Bildad, as he's talking to Job, he says, can the rush grow up without the mire. I want to speak to you in the next few minutes on the subject, if you undid, then that would undo. If you undid, then that would undo. Father, take these next few minutes. Let me help your people. Lord, there's somebody here that needs this sermon right now. I don't know who it is. But I know that you have that answer. And I pray that right now that you'd allow me to be a help to thy people, please. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What a tragic day that must have been. That day when Job was sitting in his house, a servant comes in. And the servant says, Job, I've got some bad news for you. Your camels have all been stolen. That was their form of transportation. 
Then another servant comes walking in and says, Job, I got some more bad news for you. All your sheep have been stolen. That was his wealth. In other words, his bank was robbed and had no FDIC insurance. He's broke. Then another servant walks in and says, Job, I um, hate to tell you this, but your oxen have all been killed. Get this. Lost his job. Lost his wealth. Lost his transportation. All in a matter of, of a few minutes. But then the other servant walks in. That servant walks in and says, Job, Job could tell something was wrong. That servant walks in and says, Job, I've got some bad news for you. All your children are in the oldest child's house. The roof caved in, the house caught on fire. And all ten children were killed. I've been to funerals with two caskets. I've never been to a funeral with ten. Imagine Brother Job and Mrs. Job at that funeral home that day. Ten caskets stretched across the auditorium. The heartache, the sorrow that, that, that it hit them. Then, just a day or so later, Satan had touched Job's body, given him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He had lost his job, lost his wealth, lost his transportation. Now he loses his health. And then his wife comes in and says, Job, do you have any integrity? Why don't you just curse God? And die. And oftentimes we look at Mrs. Job and we are critical of her, but may I say, let's hold off on how critical we are of Mrs. Job because you have to understand, she was going through a rough time too. She had lost her wealth. She had lost her transportation. She, her husband had just lost his job. She had just buried 10 of her children. And now the love of her life is, is sitting there in, the, in anguish with the boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And I imagine the only thing that comes to her mind is, Job, why don't you just get yourself out of your misery? Just curse God. It can all be over. Then after she said that, then three friends came, supposedly, to comfort Job. And the scripture says that when they came for seven days, they were so astonished at his grief that for seven days they sat there and didn't say one word. But then they opened the mouth. And when they open their mouth, we come to the passage of scripture that we just read. A man by the name of Bildad begins to throw the venom at Job and literally accuses Job's children. Get this now. He said, Job, if your children wouldn't have sinned, he said, then this wouldn't have happened. Because you notice right here, he talks about his children. He says in verse 4, Thy children have sinned against him, and he hath cast them away for their transgressions. Then he's saying, hey, your child, your children, the whole reason they were killed, he says, because they have sinned against God. And then he takes this, this whole thing, and then he points his finger at Job, and he says, if thou wert pure and upright, not only is he accusing Job, uh, Job's children of being sinners, thou built that is saying, Job, you're also the cause. You're the reason this whole thing has happened. And Bildad is throwing the venom at Job, but somehow a brilliant statement came out of Bildad's mouth when he said, can the rush grow up without the mire? You say, preacher, what is the rush? The rush is a plant that was found in the marshes of the Nile River. The rush is it, it need, for it to grow. 
It needs the moisture of that mire in order for it to grow. Without that moisture, that, 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 um, that rush would quickly die. If you used to pull the rush out of the mire and just try to put it in some other dirt somewhere, it would die because it needs that moisture to continue to live. And, that, and, and, and Bildad says, can the rush grow up without the mire? He's saying right here, he says, hey, this rush needs that mire in order to exist. You say, Brother Domley, what is so big about this rust? What is so important about the rust? Follow me very carefully. The skin of the rust, when it is dried and beaten out and pasted together, it supplied the writing material for those people of that day. The rust comes from a word, a word papyrus, which is the same word that we get our paper from. That rust, literally now, when it would grow up, they would harvest it, and they would they would dry it up. They would take the skin and paste that skin together. That would give them their paper that they could write on. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that if that rust didn't have the mire, you and I would not have the scriptures today. Because the scriptures that was given to them in their day was written upon that very rush, was written upon that very papyrus that they used that was growing up without the mire. You see, if you undid the mire for the rush, then you would undo the rush, and that would undo the ability for the scriptures to be passed down from generation to generation. Hey, if you undid, then that would undo. I was driving down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana this past summer. My daughter was sitting next to me. And as we're driving down to the meeting I want to preach on that Sunday, my daughter and I began to talk about a time machine. And I said to her, I said, I said Katie, I said, if, if you could go to any place in time, I said, where would you go? I'm expecting her to tell me because she's, 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 she's kind of wrapped up in the old days. She kind of likes some of that nostalgic thing from the things of the past. I'm waiting for her to tell me I'd like to go back because she likes the 50s cars. Her favorite car is a 55 um, Bel Air um, Chevy, two-door hardtop. That's her favorite car. And she, I, I thought, she said, I want to go back, but that's not what she said. As I began to talk to her, she said, Dad, if I could have a time machine, I would take us all back. She, brought, she said, I'd go back back to this one day and she mentioned when it would be and she go I would leave that place completely forget this place go straight down to Texas I said why and she then began to tell me why because she wanted to avoid one section of our life that our family went through some battles I looked back at my daughter and I said to her I said Katie I said you got to understand if you undid that window of our life, then that would undo what God is doing in our life right now. You see, we may not always like every prism, every window of our life. But man, may I tell you, every window of your life is divinely placed there by God. And if you undid some of the unpleasant trees of life, then that would undo what God has made out of you and what God is doing through your life right now. You see, if you undid, then that would undo. When I study the scriptures, I find throughout the scriptures that if we undid some of the unpleasant trees of life and the heroes of the faith, then that would undo the stories that you and I um, use to encourage ourselves. Illustration. If I undid Joseph going through the slavery of Egypt, then that would undo him becoming the prime minister under Pharaoh. If we undid um, Joseph being um, sitting in a prison cell, then that would undo him meeting Pharaoh's butler. If we undid Joseph being sold into slavery, that would undo him being able to go into Egypt and get this, then that would have undone what Joseph did to save that whole region from a humanitarian disaster. And if that disaster would have happened, get this now, Jesus Christ would not have been born. Jesus Christ would not have died on the cross. You and I would not have a hope of heaven. But you see, if you undid the unpleasant part of your life, you listen to me, then that will undo the ability for you and I to get say, hey, that he needed that unpleasantry. Why? Because it provided you and I what we have today. Amen. 
If I undid, if we undid the heartache that Job had, if we undid the 41 chapters of Job, that would undo chapter 42. Think about it. That would undo Job being blessed twice as much. That would undo Job experiencing the blessings like he had never experienced before. You see, if you undid, then that would undo. If we undid David being lonely in the wilderness, watching those, the sheep in that wilderness while his brothers are sitting at home, hey, that would undo David's ability to be able to kill the lion and the bear. If we undid the lion and the bear, get this now, that would undo David being able to have the courage to face Goliath. If we undid David facing Goliath, that would have kept David from sitting on the throne of Israel. And if that would have kept David from sitting on the throne of Israel, that would make this book bound wrong because God promised that his that the lineage of Christ would go through the seed of David, ladies and gentlemen, if you undid, hey, that would undo. That's right. Amen. If we undid the heartache that David experienced because of his adultery, get this now, that would undo Psalm 51. You see, if you undid, that would undo. If you undid Timothy growing up with the single parents example, get this now, that would undo the need for Paul in his life to bring him up and be that fatherly figure to Timothy that, and that would undo you and I having the book of Timothy that Paul, that God used Paul to write to that young preacher boy. You see, if you undid, then that would undo. If you undid Paul, the early years of, of slaughtering Christians, that would undo his ministry. Get this now, up to the Gentiles world. If you undid Moses wandering in the wilderness for 40 years trying to say stay alive, then that would undo the ability to lead the God's people through that wilderness through for 40 for 40 more years. Hey, if we undid Peter's failings in his life when he when he failed when Jesus was alive, then that would undo the wonder of the people on the day of Pentecost when they saw Peter standing up and preaching about the very Savior he had just denied a few days before. You see, if you undid, then that would undo. If we undid Esther losing her parents as a young child then that would undo Mordecai's influence upon her life. If we undid Ruth losing her husband as a young lady then that would undo her meaning Boaz and being placed in the lineage of Jesus Christ. You see the truth is we could go through the scriptures ladies and gentlemen and every heartache that is there inside the heart of individuals listen if we undid that that would undo what God has done in our lives. I'm saying ladies and Son, hey, go ahead and try to undo what's happened in your life. But may I tell you this morning, if you undo what you don't like inside your life, that will undo what God's doing through you right now. Right. There's a lot of things I wish I could undo about my life. But if I undid them, that would undo Alan Domley. You see, I grew up in a preacher's home. And if I undid growing up in a preacher's home, that would undo my experience to help churches across the nation. If I undid, the, the, if, I, if I could somehow undo growing up in a poor home, listen to me, I know what it's like to sit at a table and not have any food in the cupboards or in the refrigerator. I know how to sit, I know, how, I know what it's like to sit as a family, we hold hands and we're praying for God to bless food over empty plates. Been there. But if I undid that, that would undo the ability to me be able to live by faith for 25 years as an evangelist. Amen. If I undid some of the unpleasantries of life, if I undid going through six church splits, that would undo the encouragement that I could be to preacher's kids. If I could undo some of the early attacks in my ministry, that would undo the strength to, to withstand bigger battles later on in my ministry. You see, if I undid, listen now, that would undo. Listen to me. I don't know what, what part of your life that you don't like, but may I tell you this morning, if you undid what you are facing today, that would undo what God has for you in the future. Amen. Amen. Let me give you several statements. We'll pack our bags and go eat because I'm hungry. <laughs> Statement number one, life needs the mire. Yes. Life needs the mire. You see, life is shallow without struggles. 
you got to have struggles. Listen, what enjoyment are the good times if you don't have bad times to compare to them? I promise you, this church, we enjoy the blessings, but the reason why we enjoy the blessings, yeah, hey, okay, you know why you don't complain as much, those who've been here a long time, about us having two services? Because you remember the tent. Brother Bill, you remember that? Thank God I was done the earlier service. I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have come during those days. Snakes going through the auditorium, I'm out of there. You say, why? I hate snakes. It don't matter how big they are. I hate them. I mean, if it's a, a, a snake like that, I'm gone. We're, I'm not one of them snake handlers. I hear people say, well, you, could you be a snake handler? Absolutely not. I would die of a heart attack in, in the very first time. I'm telling you, I couldn't handle it. But see, you're, you, you're, this, this means nothing to you. Why? Because you go back to those days where you sat in the tent on a day like this when it was hot and your man, your sweat's pouring down your back and you're thinking, preacher, please don't make it long because it's hot in here. Huh? Listen to me. You see, life needs the mire. Like, hey, there is that you you can't enjoy the mountaintop without the valley. Yeah. I often hear people say, Well, I love living on the mountaintop. Listen to me, I'd rather have the valley. Why? Flowers don't grow on mountaintops. Yeah. Come on. Streams don't grow, don't flow on top of a mountain. You can't fish on top of a mountain. Somebody help me out just a little bit. Coming down to where we all live. Hey, the flowers don't grow on top of the mountain. No, we enjoy the stream. We enjoy the fishing. We enjoy the vegetation. We enjoy the flowers. Where? In the valley. Hey, I'm telling you, life needs the mire. Statement number two. Every part of your history is divinely placed in your life by God. Listen, your cancer is not an uh-oh. Somebody can say amen right now. Amen. Your heartaches, not uh, God didn't wake up this morning and say, wow, I didn't know you was going through that. Yep. Amen. It's not an uh-oh for a child to lay in a hospital when God knew about it. And it's divinely placed in your life by God. God knew what you would go through in the ministry, but it was divinely placed in your life by God. You listen to me, we can complain, we can gripe, we can murmur, but may I say, you gotta understand, life needs the mire. And may I also say, hey, that, that every part of the history of your life is divinely placed there in your life by God. Illustration. We all enjoy that song that Charles Weigel wrote that no one ever cared for me but like Jesus. But you know when that was written? That was written in the mire of life. That was written when Charles Weigel, he comes home from a revival meeting. His wife is sitting at the table. Her bags are packed. She looks at Mr. Weigel and says, she said to her husband, she goes, honey, you have a choice tonight. She goes, I'm tired of your traveling. I'm tired of your always oh, being God. You have a choice. You can either choose God, and if you choose God, I'll walk out. Or she said, you can choose me, but you have to quit the ministry and quit on God. And Charles Weigel looked back at his wife and said, if you put it that way, I've always got to choose God. His wife picked up her suitcases and walked out that door. And Charles Weigel thought his ministry was over. Get this, but that was divinely placed in his life by God. Why? That night was the night he wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And that song has blessed hundreds of thousands of people. Why? Because it was placed in the life of an individual, the mire that, that many would have thought, oh, it's terrible. Hey, it's been a blessing to others. That's right. I think I think of the, the song that we sing, It Is Well With My Soul. Hold on, hold on. That story was born in the mire. That was a daddy 
whose wife and children were going overseas. The, sea, the, the ship had sunk and his two daughters died at sea and as he's going to meet his wife on the other side, the captain of the ship came and said, Mr. Spafford, I just want you to know that this is where your daughters are lying at sea. And he went outside. He had that graveside service of his daughters looking down, but it was there while he stood over the waters of his, of his, uh, the waters of his daughter's grave that he stood there. He began to write the song, Hey, um, it is well with my soul. Oh, we love that song. We like it when it comes down to that last verse. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight and the clouds be rolled back as it's go. Oh, we enjoy that. But hold on. Hey, that was divinely placed in his life. Why? Because if you undid that, then that would undo the blessing for you and me. Yep. If you undid Brother Hiles growing up with a drunken daddy, A man who God used to build the largest independent Baptist church of our lifetime. But had a drunken daddy, and when he told his daddy that God had called him to preach, his drunken daddy looked back at him and said, well, if you're going to be a blankety-blank preacher, why don't you go build the largest blankety-blank church in the world? And it was that mother of his life that drove him for God to use him to do something mighty. Why? If you undid, hey, that would undo. Yeah. Amen. That's right. I'm saying, life needs a mire. I said statement number two. Every part of your history is divinely placed in your life by God. Statement number three. Stop fighting the mire of your life. Stop fighting it. Let, let me give you a little bit of tough love. Ready? It's time to get over it. Amen. You can only complain about it for so long. Time to get over it. Why? Because as long as you fight the mire, then God can't use that mire to help others. Which leads me to statement number four. Your mire is what makes you profitable to others. Amen. Hey, teenager. Growing up in a single parent home. So I don't like it. Okay, let me help you out. That's your story. Now, you can look at it and you can say, I don't like this, or you can say, okay, God allowed me to go through it. So instead of complaining and griping about it, why don't you do something with your life and one day grow up and be used of God and get married and stay married and show your children how to have a good home? Yeah. Amen. In our church back home, We got a couple right now in our church that are both, both have cancer. And I'm not just talking, I mean, we're talking doctors have told both of them, your cancer is going to take you. Brother Sandberg, the amazing thing to me is I watched this couple going through chemo, going through all the treatments that they're going through, faithful to church. Get this. Even coming to soul winning time. And I've sat there, Brother Bill, and I've watched Brother Hamilton walk into our soul winning. When I'm going to soul winning, I'm griping just a bit. And I see that couple coming to soul winning time. I said to myself, wow, they're not letting the mire destroy them. Because there's something about watching them encourage others when they show up at
after they've been to the doctor, when they come to church and you know they're dying, when they have a smile on their face and yet you go talk to them and they act like nothing's going on, you say, what is it? They've accepted the mire of their life and God's using them to be a blessing to others. Several years ago, Meyer hit my family. Phone call from my mama. My dad had been arrested. Ended up in jail. Now he's been in prison for the last nine years. For a long time, I tried to cover up the mire. For a long time, I'd say to God, God, why would you let me go through that? I mean, I've, I've been in evangelism all these years. And I'm thinking, God, why in the world you've given me this good family and now my daddy sits in prison? Why? And it wasn't until I came to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When I was reading, when Paul three times went to God and said, God, take this away, just like what I had done. That God said to him, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. He said, for my strength is made perfect. In weakness. And as long as I fought the mire, one day when God came to Alan Domley and said, is my grace not good enough for you? Yeah. Amen. And I don't know who you are, but I'm, let me ask you something. Is, is God's grace not good enough for you? for your mire. Because when you accept the grace of God and say, okay, this is what God has given to me. I accept it. That's when God says, now your mire can become the testimony to help others. When I finally accepted what God placed in my life, I was amazed how many people God started leading across my path with the same story. Now I understood what they were going through. Now I could help them because I knew. I understand the hurt. And see, God placed your mire in your life he divinely placed it in your life because there's someone that you could help if you were to simply say, okay, I accept God's grace. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. You better accept the mire of Calvary. You see, no one ever gets to heaven because they went to church. No one ever goes to heaven because they've been baptized. No one ever goes to heaven because they're good. They go to heaven because they accept what Jesus did on Calvary when he was beaten and, and bruised and, and spit upon. And they drove the nails to his hand and his feet. And they, and they killed And he died on that cross of Calvary, shed his blood. Why? So our sins can be paid for. He was buried. And three days later, he rose again and conquered death. Hey, if we took away the mire of Calvary, that would take away the hope of salvation. Sometime in your life, you need to get born again. Amen. You need to go to Jesus Christ and accept his payment for your sins. And at that moment when you accept his payment for your sins, that mire that Jesus went through will give you the salvation so you can go to heaven. I don't know what your needs are this morning. Preacher's not talked to me. He's not said, Brother Donnelly, this person's doing this. And 
he just told me that you're dating her and now I realize you, really you need help because he, but anyway I don't know what your story is if I came out this morning I said hey tell your story what's your mire what's the mire you're facing. It's time you realize God placed it in your life so that you can be a blessing to someone else. That's right. That's right. I told my wife a long time ago, and I'll say this and be done, probably say something else and be done again. You know how we preachers are. I told my wife, I said, you know, honey, I said, we are God's object lesson to the world. And I mean this, I don't mind being his object lesson. Because if somehow my life on this earth can help somebody else get saved, somebody else get closer to God, it's okay. But you got to come and say, this is my mire. The rush, if you undo it, if you undid the mire of your life, it would undo who you are right now. That's why, that's why it bothers me about America trying to undo what we've done in history. You undo our history, that will undo America. You undo what our forefathers went through so that you and I can have freedoms. That would undo the greatness that America has been to the world. Hey, if you undid, hey, that would undo. Amen. Stop fighting your mire and use it to be a blessing to someone else. Father, you know the needs. God, the truth is this morning I realize this morning that you've divinely placed things in our life on purpose. May we not fight it. May we accept it. May we understand you have a purpose for everything inside of life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking. I wonder if there's someone here this morning, you say, Brother Donnelly, I'm saved. I know I'm saved, but I'll be honest with you, I needed that reminder this morning. And preacher, as you close in prayer, remember me in prayer, God spoke to my heart. If you like that, would you slip your hand way up high all over the auditorium? I see hands all over the place. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Who else is going to say, Preacher, I didn't raise my hand with these. I should have. Brother Donnelly, as you close in prayer, include me in that prayer. I needed that reminder this morning. So someone else, would you slip your hand up high? I see that hand right there. Someone else, and this hand right here. Someone else, and that hand back there. Someone else, I needed that reminder this morning. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see this hand right here and this one over here. I ask you one other question. I want for someone here this morning say, Preacher, if I died right now, I'm not even sure my next breath would be in heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But I'm just not sure that I'm saved. So anyone like that, say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I die right now. My next breath will be in heaven. But I'd like to know that. Would you slip your hand way up high? I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. I see that hand right there. God bless you. Put it down. I see that hand right there. God bless you. Put it down. I see this hand over here. God bless you. Put it down. Not sure if I died right now. My next breath will be in heaven. So someone else, say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Anyone else? Anyone else? Not sure if I died right now. My next breath will be in heaven. God bless you. You can put it down. Someone else, I'm not sure if I died right now. My next breath be in heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Preacher, pray for me. Is there someone else? Anyone else? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you. If you just raised your hand, let me just be very honest with you. You're not promised tomorrow. God put you here in this service to get enough gospel so his Holy Spirit could convict you to get saved. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And as soon as I'm done praying, we will stand to our feet. Heads will be bowed. Eyes will be closed. And I'll point to the instrumentalists and they'll begin to play. When they begin to play, 
Christians are going to leave their seat, go to the nearest aisle, come down the front and kneel down at this altar. If you raised your hand this morning and said, Brother Domley, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Pray for me. If you raised your hand, then you find myself or the pastor, one of the workers at the front, and we'll have someone take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can get this thing settled about your salvation. Whatever your need is, you take care of it today. Father, you know the needs. Holy Spirit of God, bless this invitation as only you can. I beg for these who are not saved, may today be that day of salvation. For these who raise their hand, that mire that they're facing today, God, whatever it is, may they accept the grace you've given to them. God, may they use that mire to help others, please. Bless this invitation as only you can, I pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, everyone standing to their feet. No 